Yes, yes, we were right. We were right about a lot of the stuff we talked about in the previous episode. But before we get into that, how you guys doing out there? Greetings, oh, good word, gentlemen, uh, viewers. It's your boy Hated. You already knew that if you were here. And we're here for the Kotetsujo No Kabinari Episode Five Review Impressions, whatever. Basically, the video. It came out yesterday. I got I watched it when I got home, so I got I was just gonna hop right into it. We were right about a lot of the things we were talking about in the last episode and episodes before then. We see it in the very beginning of the episode. Ikoma is the focus from the beginning of the episode, but it kind of tapers off of that a little bit later, and I didn't like that. I'll explain why later. Ikoma in the beginning is the focus of the episode. We get to see more of the Ikoma that we learned about in the beginning of the series. He's the same person doing the same thing he was doing in the very first episode, the first time we meet him, um, using that brain of his and creating weapons and doing research. We see that now, except now it's not just him being secluded, it's him trying to share that hard work that he's put in with other people. He's essentially trying to equip other people to be able to fight the Kabane. I'm, perhaps it's because he's realizing that he can't do it alone, that him, him and Mume can't do it alone. It's gonna take more than just the two of them to fight the forces that are kind of in the way of everyone that's on the Kotsetsu jail so far. So we see him developing weapons. Some of the weapons that we see in the OP. One in particular caught my attention because I literally, I had been thinking about it for a while and I spoke about it in detail in the last episode. You can, you'll go watch that if you haven't yet. Hopefully you have. You can see there, there's a blade and in that, that blade is in the hand of Kurusu in the OP, and he's doing work with it, destroying Kabane with no effort, essentially. And I remember noticing that with what we saw in the last episode, he can't just use a regular blade for an extended period of time against them because it's not durable. The Kabane are hardened, and their heart is near impossible to penetrate with a regular blade. In fact, when he tries to, it completely shatters. And what ends up happening here is we see Akoma has been working on a new, I guess, prototype of a blade. And the blade looks exactly like the one we see Kurusu using in the OP. So that's the reason I, I theorized that somehow he was gonna get one. And I like that it's Akoma who developed this blade. It makes sense. It's kind of, that, that will literally serve as a bridging the gap kind of mechanism between him and Kurusu, because Kurusu still doesn't trust them. He doesn't really like them. He's his duty to Oyame is what makes him work with them because he has to protect her. And she sees them as like, I suppose a necessary evil. Or not even necessarily an evil, she sees them as protectors. So he will do what he can to protect her even if she's putting herself in harm's way. This blade might serve as a way for Ikoma to kind of bridge the gap and reason with the man. Like, listen, I, I'm not the monster you think I am. Look what, a Kabane wouldn't be able to do this. He wouldn't be able to create something for you that A, destroys Kabane, and B, works <laughs> marvelously. Not to mention, if you look into the art of creating a blade in any part of the world, but specifically for Japanese blades, where it's the most renowned, depending on who you speak to about the topic, it's a very precise, very articulate, very complicated and difficult task. It's something you would not really imagine a Kabane being able to do. And Ikoma can do that. That's how the episode starts. Some other things happen, but that's it. That's the only, that moment is the only time we see any character building for Ikoma. This episode to me was the weakest of the five episodes that have aired. It's still a good episode, especially with what happened at the end, the last sequence and what it sets up for the next episode. This episode I think is the weakest. There are numerous reasons for that. The first I would say is, in the last video for the last episode, I theorized that the reason every episode literally began where the last one ended was because they wanted to keep in line with the theme of, you know, a kotetsujo, a train, where every episode is a car of the train, supposedly. And every episode leaves right where the other one took off. This episode doesn't really do that. And what I mean by that is, you can theorize that it's taking place after the events of the last episode, but it's not directly connected. Time has passed and we don't know how much time has passed. It could be it could be hours, it could be a day. I assume it's days because of how far they've traveled and where they've arrived. Uh, you'll find out what I mean when you watch the episode. But there's no direct link to it. Like there has been in a previous episode where every episode 
ended on a way where when the next episode came out, it picked up directly where that left off. And that's a minor thing. My issue with this episode is, this is another episode where we're seeing more and more focus on Mume. And it makes me wonder, is Mume the main character of the show? Because if that's the case, why put so much effort on a coma in the beginning? And why not portray Mume as the main character? I wouldn't have a problem with Mume being the main character. I don't like her as much as I like Akoma, but she's a cool character. You could have made, and perhaps I would have liked her more if you would actually put more effort and time in the beginning to building her up. Or maybe they're trying to make up for lost time, who knows? But my other issue with that is that there's still characters in this show that need to be fleshed out that have not been fleshed out yet. There are characters in the show who, if you ask most people to name them, they wouldn't be able to tell you the name because their names haven't been said in the show. In fact, we finally got a name for one of the characters I didn't know his name for in this episode. The longer haired gentleman who hits on the pink haired girl. I still don't know her name. The longer haired guy that's really skeptical about things and really relatable for most people. The one that was hitting on the pink haired woman when they were fixing the Kotetsujo in episode, was it two? Sukurai and Takumi, and Takumi being Ikoma's, that's his bro, get paired up to do some things in this episode. And because of that, that's how I found out his name. But no, this episode is primarily about Mume and her dealing with being around humans. Mume is worried that she's getting soft being around these humans for this extended period of time. And that's not a luxury she has being a Kabaneri. She has to be ready to fight because as we've seen the Kabaneri, they come out of nowhere, they attack in large numbers, and it's very devastating. She has to be ready to go. Especially since she doesn't have the privilege the Koma has of being able to fight for as long as the fight needs. She has a limited amount of time that she can go before she needs to rest. So she's, I guess she's perpetually ready for that so she can maximize her time and then be in rest mode. She meets a member of whatever secret organization she's in. We assumed that the secret organization was ran by her brother. I'm assuming older brother because she's not very old herself. And when he showed the flashback of that dude doing that thing with the gun, I believe, that was a larger man who looked like he would probably be older than her. But she meets another cohort that happens to have formerly been in that organization that she's in. And they have an exchange that basically tells her that she's grown soft and she starts to worry about that. And that leads to her doing some questionable things, not only to the people that she's starting to actually grow a friendship with and these people that are finally starting to accept her, but to a coma directly. She starts to be combative with him in terms of him making plans and it, it, it's to the detriment of everything. It, it sets off some events that happen in the episode. That might be a personal issue I take with the show because of the characters I like. And Mume isn't the top tier character. I mean, I like her. There's no characters in the show I dislike. They're all good characters. It's just that if you were to ask me to name like my top three characters, it'd be Kurusu, Ikoma, Takumi. Well, it, it, I. I'm not even sure about Takumi. Takumi and the pink haired girl, which is funny, I still don't know her name. They're up there. The, I really like the pink haired girl's character just because she doesn't even get that much camera time, but when she's on camera, she steals the show. She's very captivating. I can relate to her and the way she responds to people's cowardice and just annoyed at people who are just stupid. I like her character a lot. And I mean, she's she has a straight, I mean, having pink hair in this show, most of the characters have, other than Ayame who has purplish black hair, all the other characters, and oh, Kurusu, whose hair is blue. Most of the characters have traditional black or extremely dark brown hair. So if your character has hair that stands out, then it's easier for me to remember them, obviously. This episode, like I said earlier, is the weakest of the five, but it's not bad at all. It's a great episode. The ending does save it, by and large. The ending sequence, everything that happened in the last five to seven minutes. But there's a sequence that happens where, A, Mume, show skill again she just shows how much of a beast she is b she is shown to have weakness she's not unbeatable we see that in this in this now we understand what she meant by needing a coma to be her shield she needs a coma she can't be this monster by herself and it makes sense because when she was first introduced to the show she wasn't by herself she literally had someone with her that's probably why it's not just the whole oh I'm, you know, I can't fight for a super long time, I get tired. It might also be the fact that her fighting style is very dependent on having a partner. She needs a strong, sturdy partner, 
which is why the, her former partner was that brolic swole dude who's dedicated to the cause. And now that she has a coma who is just like her and seems to be even more adorable than she is, which is kind of crazy, can go longer than she can, which is crazy. And with training will probably become more powerful than her. That's someone that can be a front line while she does all of the, the hi-fi acrobatic lethal moves because that's what she's really good at. She's very good at finishing off things very quickly, partially because she's had to. The symbolism in this episode, it wasn't really there like it was previously. I don't know. This episode, if you ask me, this episode was the down moment for the anime. So, I mean, you can't have an anime that's 10 out of 10 for every single episode. Everything is go. There are very few series that I can think of that do that and all of them were extremely short. I don't, I think this is only supposed to be 12 episodes. I hope it's not. This had better at least be 26 for season one. This episode, this series is amazing. Even though this is a down episode, I'm still giving this, I wanted to give this a seven out of 10, but I have to give it an eight because that ending, everything that happened at the end there was just, it was just great to me. Seeing Ikoma finally, you know, stepping into a leadership role himself we see again Takumi kind of being that anchor for him. Ikoma asked Takumi and uh, Sukari to do something dangerous, to risk themselves, but he would protect them. He, Mume, and the other people that accompanied him would protect them while they did it because they needed, they basically needed to activate a machine and they're the only people that would have the knowledge to activate it. So he asked them to do it and they agree because partially because they're gonna protect, they're gonna have protection and also because obviously, when they look at what Ikoma and Mume are doing to protect everyone, it's like, you can't really be angry when they ask you to take a risk and these two are risking their lives every time Kobani are present. He's worried for his own well-being, but he's, he's equally as worried for Ikoma. He doesn't like the idea, and I think it's starting to strain on him. He doesn't like the idea of Ikoma having to be a sacrificial lamb. Even if you are a Kaminarian, you can take bites from the Kobani and not having to worry about dying or whatever. That doesn't mean you should. He doesn't like the idea of leaving his friend behind him. And that's a sign of a real friend. I, I mean, that's how I am. I couldn't really, I, I can't personally fathom banning someone. That's probably why I like Takumi so much as a character. He's just relatable to me in terms of how I view friendship. I know it's a hyper idealized, but it's pretty cool to me. This episode, yeah, I would definitely say watch it, obviously, just to see what happens. And I, again, the end, the way the end is set up, we see at least two to three more Wazatori in this episode. Yeah, one of them was using blades and was fighting well and fighting well enough where even after it was dispatched, I believe Mume is injured and didn't even notice. That's how quickly the, the, the wound happened. There's another Kabane, and I'm not sure if it's technically a Wazatori or if it's another classification, because I'm trying to figure out if Wazatori are simply Kabane that can fight like humans can fight with technique, or if Wazatori are specifically Kabane that fight with weapons. And the reason I ask this is because there's a Kabane in this episode who is a extremely adept and skilled fighter, but he doesn't have weapons. He's fighting, it's a very big one, obviously. The, the Wazatori's tend to be larger than the rest. Big brawlic one, he's got hands and that's what he uses. He's a, he's a hand-to-hand -hand melee fighter just out there putting knuckles on cats. And this dude, has no weapon, so I don't know if he's technically a Wazatori or not. Perhaps there's another classification for him. It's not mentioned in the, in the episode, so who knows? So much was happening, and the fight scene between him and Mume had Mume by herself. There was no one for her to talk to to explain who he was, so the context hasn't happened yet. Perhaps that'll happen in the next episode. It, it was just cool to see Mume go up against a Kabane that she couldn't just dispatch like she was dispatching the rest of them. In fact, she essentially gets bopped partially because she'd been fighting and she's probably fatigued, also just because she's been fighting so much of them and she was probably starting to get overwhelmed and because this one was a problem. The cool thing about it is Ikoma comes in to save the day, but the way he does not isn't some idealized fancy, no. He does it in a very practical fashion. He utilizes the weapon he created. He, put, he literally pulls up the 12 gauge, pulls up the pump, puts a hole in the dude's chest, you know? Like, like they say, you know, when the bullet sinks in, it leaves a burning sensation, you know, 12 gauge to the roof. Actually, I don't even think that gun shoots bullets. I'm pretty sure it shoots like compressed air. Whatever, you know what I mean. You see him becoming more used to doing it. There's so much that's gonna happen. The cliffhanger, it's not even really a cliffhanger. It's just, it was kind of a holy crap moment 
at the end when you saw what was there. I'm not even gonna mention that at all, I don't wanna spoil it. Trying to figure out what Ikoma and Mume are going to do with the predicament at their end. I'm hypothesizing more things that's gonna happen in the next episode. Obviously, the thought of abandonment is gonna be there. Do we, do we leave them or do we try and help them? Can we help them? Do we know if they're alive? I, I mean, obviously we know they're not gonna be abandoned and they're gonna, you know, they'll, they'll all come back together, but maybe there'll be some losses, who knows? Maybe people won't be the same. Mume's already being different and being more cold. That, that might not be something that's, you know, temporary. That might be permanent. Is Kuz gonna to get to use that blade finally? He's in this episode, but only in passing and talking. He can't be in action. He's still injured from the previous fight, even though it's not just a wound to the abdomen. He also had his arm in a, in a, in a sling, so who knows? He literally can't use a blade if his arm was in a sling. And I think he did injure his arm when he attacked the Wazatori the second time to make sure it didn't interfere with Ikoma and uh, Ayame when they were when she was giving him the blood for the blood contract to help him be re-energized and to basically say you were here as a protector. But I think when he fell from that stabbing the, the Wazatori to slow him down, he probably hurt his arm. But yeah, he's out of action, which it was another interesting aspect of this too, because essentially the only renowned warriors they had going into this was Ikoma, Ayame, and the big brolic warrior dude that's cool with Kurosu that wears the red. That was it. Everyone else were just novice warriors that were armed with the new weapons that Ikoma made for them, minus the blade. The blade, I don't know that it's finished, and I think it's really interesting how he explained what it was too. The idea of taking, I believe he says it's the material of the Kabane heart and essentially putting it around the blade to, to reinforce it and strengthen it. A, how, how would you do that? Like, is he melting Kabane hearts? Can you melt them? I mean, I assume that they'd probably be meltable, but the temperature would be extremely high, and I don't know that they have the tech to do that here, but who knows, really? And B, is there gonna be a side effect? Like, how do we know that Kusu using that blade, or whoever uses the blade eventually, for an extended period of time, doesn't start to have side effects or something? Maybe it permeates or radiates an aura, or radiation, radiates or radiation, that's redundant, that would affect the user. Who knows? All I know is this series has so much promise right now with what's happening. The weapons that Kuma's making, people starting to step into roles and starting to define themselves. Ayame being the leader and having some tough decisions coming up for her. I, I don't envy her position. And Mume being conflicted as she is right now. She's that's the best word I can use is conflicted. She's conflicted this whole episode and it's affecting her judgment affecting her actions and her loyalty almost. And she's very combative and it's weird. But yeah, definitely check this out. If you have your own thoughts on this episode, if you disagree with anything I've said or you want to correct me, comment below, school me. I'm not too proud. Hey, I comment, I read the comments because I ain't big yet. And even when I get big, this is what I'll be doing. I read the comments, I respond to them as well. So comment below with opinions of the video, opinions of the episode, theories you have, um, anything really, just comment below, hit the like button. And before I forget, there was a user, this is not the first video he's done this for me on, I believe he did it on the first two as well, but he left some really informative comments on my last video, which is why I say you guys need to comment and read the comment section and interact with each other. I learned some stuff that I didn't know about Japan Japanese language and some of the themes of the series that really started to click once he informed me of this. His name is Tia Opiak. I hope I'm, I'm probably butchering it. He can let me know below how to actually pronounce it, uh, phonetic, pronounce it phonetically. I'll put an annotation with the text, but I, I wanna say thank you to him or her. It could be a her. I assume it's him, but you never know. Uh, thank you to this person for, for informing me, for engaging with me and schooling me and keep it coming, man. I really appreciate it, so thanks. Um, but yeah, like I said, man, comment below, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button as well. The like button, subscribe button, the subscribe button's way more important. Hit them both. Tell your friends about this. Tell other people about this. Come to come check out the channel. Get, leave that feedback below. If you need to contact me, you already know where to hit me up. My, my anime list is linked. My Twitter is linked. You can hit me up there. Um, I play PlayStation and Xbox. You can find me on there. I'll link those below as well, I suppose. And as always, it's your boy Hated Greatness. Thanks for watching, man.